A very good morning to all of you. Today, we have a special guest with us. He is Mr. Desmond Lee, Minister for National Development. He has some exciting news to share with all of us. Minister, please. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Please. Thank you very much. A very good morning to all our fellow gardening enthusiasts. It's good to meet so many of you online today as part of this year's Community Garden Festival. Now, even though we're still in the midst of COVID-19, we hope to reach out to even more people and grow our community of gardeners. Today, we celebrate the gardening community's efforts and achievements. In fact, over the years, we've worked with many stakeholders to green Singapore, and our community gardeners have been an important part of these efforts. Since 2005, our community gardeners have set up more than 1,600 gardens island-wide. Now, these gardens create pockets of urban greenery that beautify our neighbourhoods. Now, they've also the potential to strengthen our urban ecosystems by attracting and supporting birds, butterflies and other pollinators. This will support our efforts to transform Singapore into a city in nature. Now, in addition, many of our community gardeners grow edible plants in their gardens, from papayas and limes to herbs and spices. Now, doing so raises awareness of the value of food and the need to avoid food wastage. We also learn to better appreciate the efforts of our local farmers. Gardening with edibles therefore complements our 30 by 30 push to produce 30% of our nutritional needs in Singapore by 2030. This is part of our strategy to strengthen food security and build greater social resilience. Let me thank all of you, our community gardeners, for being active stewards of our environment. We'll continue to work with you to set up even more community gardens in the years to come. Now, this morning, I'd like to also share with you some upcoming plans that we have in store to further promote gardening as part of our greening journey. You know that NPARCS introduced the Allotment Garden Scheme in 2016 to provide more space for gardening. So far, we've made available more than 1,000 allotment garden plots for rent in 11 parks all across the island. Now, there was an overwhelming response and all these plots were taken up quickly. Therefore, I'm very happy to share that we'll have yet another 1,000 new allotment garden plots across nearly 20 parks and gardens ready by the end of next year. Now, tomorrow, we will open more than 200 new plots up for balloting in West Coast, Aljunit, Bongol and Yishun. In addition, we will make available an additional 50,000 seed packets of beginner-friendly edible plants as an extension of our Gardening with Edibles initiative. These will be given out to participants who join us on our online activities and events this weekend during the Community Garden Festival. NPARCS will also distribute 10,000 seed packets of edible plants which are more challenging to grow, such as capsicum, radish and zucchini, to experienced gardeners like yourselves who attend NPARC's virtual garden masterclasses. Now, these masterclasses will be held over the next few months on a monthly basis. To further support Singaporeans' interest in edible garden, NPARC's will provide more resources to grow this movement. We want to help interested organisations set up their own allotment gardens in our housing estates or beyond. Our new allotment garden design guidelines will share key design principles for such gardens. We are also launching good practices for corridor gardening, a collection of tips to grow edible plants along common corridors. Successfully and responsible growing is a key. Now, finally, our new guidelines on horticulture best practices for edible gardening will help gardeners to grow edible plants healthily and in a sustainable and hygienic way. We hope all these efforts will encourage all of us to try our hand at gardening, whether at home, in an allotment garden, or a community garden. This is a meaningful activity that can strengthen bonds between friends, families, and society as a whole. It can bring us hope and cheer during challenging times like these. Gardening and greenery can also improve our well-being and our mental resilience. Now, for those of you who would like to find out more, Professor Kwa Ihyok, NUS Mind Science Centre and NParks, 
recently published a book, Nature, Health and Happiness. I want to congratulate Professor Kwa and the team for the work on the importance of nature and the environment to human life. Let me also take the opportunity to congratulate our young winners of the Every Child a Seed competition, which over 45 schools participated in. This celebrates our young gardeners' success at growing various plants, their creativity, and the values learned through their gardening journey. For example, one of our competition winners initially faced difficulties in sprouting her roselle seed and tending to her plant. But with advice from her grandparents and some perseverance, her, her roselle plant did not just survive, but it thrived. Now this just goes to show how gardening can bring together generations and teach us to keep a hopeful spirit even in trying times. The support of the community and our people's appreciation for nature are integral parts of our journey to transform Singapore into a city in nature. So thank you all for being a part of this journey. Now allow me to just say a few words in Mandarin for our Mandarin-speaking friends. Huayun 以及推出有关食用园艺和走廊园艺的新指南原地的设计指南你的城市的愿景。我期待大家能和我们一起踏上这个绿色旅程。祝大家有个愉快的周末。Now I will now leave you in the good hands of our N Parks gardening guru, Dr. Wilson Wong. I wish everyone a very happy community garden festival. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. To be very frank, when I see the number of people who sign up for this webinar, 
you know, I'm very ganjong because it's really overwhelming. Thank you for your avid support. Today in our first gardening webinar here, we're going to share with you how you can grow capsicums and chilies in Singapore. In this part of the world, capsicums and chilies are an important part of our cuisine. They not only add colour, they also add flavour. They spice up our dishes, isn't it? So, for those of you who are gardeners out there, you have grown, you know, these plants, capsicums and chilies. I'm pretty sure you know how beautiful they can actually get. The many fruits that they produce, the colours of the fruits, and the architecture of the plant is really amazing, right? It's very beautiful, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of you like to grow them because they not only look good, they also taste good. However, they are not the easiest plants to grow, isn't it? So that's the reason why I took some time to study the growing and the cultivation of these plants. And I'm sharing it with you today. And I hope you'll find the tips useful. But before I go on, let me share with you, you know, the kind of chili plants and the capsicum plants that are available. On my right, you see this tall fella here? This is the Brazilian starfish. As you can see, the fruits are quite interesting, right? They look like a star, and they are flat. I think they look like UFOs. And this plant has just started the fruit, actually. And if you allow it to grow, the branches will arch over, and lots of red-hanging fruits. Very, very pretty. And next to it is a crystal chili. It is a local variety. I mean, the name is the local name given by our nursery people here. For those of you who have visited our Singapore Garden Festival Horticulture Show last year, this was the plant, or this variety, was being showcased. It was grown by me, and we actually won you know, the best of category with this plant. And you can easily see why. The plant reliably fruits at every node. All right? And the fruits actually change colour as they develop and they mature. Pretty good for Christmas, isn't it? Right? So in Singapore, tropical Singapore, probably don't need a, a Christmas tree or pine tree. I would be very happy if I have a chilly Christmas tree. All right? There's still a lot, of, there's still ample time to grow. So get some seeds to grow your chilies to celebrate Christmas. All right? Let me introduce to you other chilli varieties. The one I have here, all right, it is what we call the Biquin Ho cultivar. It is very interesting. All right. It has fruits that are this small and it has a sharp tip there. So it's like the bird's beak. It looks small, but pretty hot. And of course, over here, this, little, this plant here, it produces hanging yellow fruits. That is lemon dropped. Okay? So it has a bit of a fruity flavour to it on top of the spiciness. Pretty good if you add a little bit to your salads, but omit the seeds, you know that it's very hot there. So hanging yellow pendulous fruit that brighten up your balcony. And of course, I have shown you um, chilies and cultivars, I mean cultivars that have green leaves. But there are also other varieties, all right? They have coloured leaves, all right? So like, for example, this pot here is so black, I think quite difficult to see on the screen, but this is the black pearl because the fruits are round and black, and the leaves are so dark in purple that look almost black in colour, right? Adds a, you know, a shroud of mystery over it, you know. Uh, this plant is quite small compared to the rest. It's still young, it can still grow slightly bigger, and now you, next to it, I have a variegated one, I would say yin and yang contrast. I have something with white leaves. So this is a ve typical variegated chili you can get from most nurseries. And you see the leaves are white, very, very pretty, right? And the um, fruits that are produced, they have just started flowering and fruiting. So eventually the fruits will turn orange and red and will add contrast to the foliage. Okay? So, and they will peak above the leaves, the canopy, very pretty. All right, so these are the, you know, the plants that I can show you because there's just so many. I have no space, you know, really. Otherwise, I'll be really in a chili capsicum forest. But, 
You know, before we go on, let me explain to you a little bit. All right? In this part of the world, we call these huge fruits here capsicums. And of course, there will be people who will call them sweet peppers. All right? Um, they're not very spicy compared to the chilies that we are familiar with. All right? And of course, you have lots of chilies here that I have, and all the rest that I'm showcasing, they are hot. And very often, we call them chilies because they are hot. And of course, if you check on the internet, people will call them hot peppers. But regardless, the variety, the cultivar, or the hybrid, you know, um, you know, I make the language simple. They all belong to the genus Capsicum. All right? They come from different species, and there's lots of breeding going on, and you get lots of cultivars and hybrids. So let me just showcase some fruits. You know, I'm very happy. I have friends who also grow chilies and capsicums, and we share our growing experiences. And they also shared with me their fruits, and I'm sharing it you know, with all of you here, you know, the diversity, very pretty. So I like those you know, um, ch chili capsicum cultivars that have you know, interesting sh fruit shapes. All right? So like Matt Hatter, you see, it looks like a bell, a hat that you wear. All right? And Peter Pepper. All right, oops, he decided to drop. But the, he is a naughty pepper. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what it looks like. You can imagine. Otherwise, you can Google a little bit and find out what Peter Pepper is. All right, it's a naughty pepper, but it's very hot. And this one is from Japan. It's a hot mouthful, but it's also called Witch's One because the fruits are very, very long. And this is still actually a developing fruit that I have kind of like harvested to show all of you. Otherwise, it, it, I think it will actually take half the, half the board here. Okay? And of course, there are many others you can see that, um, in particular, I like candy cane. All right? Candy cane, the plant is variegated. All right? And you can see that the fruit itself is also variegated, green and yellow. And of course, eventually, it will ripen, turns red. All right, so I would share with you that if you want to harvest chili seeds, um, you will want to take it from ripe fruits, those fruits that have turned red, okay? And because they are hot, all right? Um, just to share the experience with you that last time when I was kind of like excited, I didn't really care too much about the spiciness. I just went ahead and sliced and took the seeds out. And I really regretted it because some of the very hot, spicy ones, they really burn you. Okay? And for me, I would say that please wear a glove when you want to take chili seeds, all right? Because they are extremely hot, actually. Okay? And they can burn you. So if you actually rub your eyes and all that, wow, you know, it's, you probably need to visit the clinic or the hospital. Okay? So I warn you first, please wear gloves before you actually harvest seeds from chilies and harvest from ripe fruits. Okay? So I hope this part is clear and I excited you with the, uh, with the wide variety of chilies that you can actually grow. It's just a tip of the iceberg, whatever that I have here. So what do chili plants need? Um, capsicum plants need, you know? What do these plants need, actually, uh, in terms of growing conditions? They, like most edible plants, love the sun. Um, if you have a balcony or corridor, you know, our sun in these areas, in high-rise, we don't get the full-day sun. So you would probably need to ensure that they get direct or filtered sunshine for at least four hours daily. And of course, for those of you with small spaces, and you might not have a bright balcony or corridor, and you know, you don't have a garden space outdoors, you can actually try to grow the smaller ones. All right? And you can grow them under artificial lights. This, uh, Plants thrive under artificial lights. Um, we have a showcase in Drone Lake Gardens where I work, where I put up an artificial light showcase. You can actually refer to that and take some tips, and you can do up your own light garden at home, and you can grow edibles, even though you might not have a lot of sun, and you might not have space. Okay? Start off with a few plants so that it's easy for you, and you can manage. Okay? So light, four hours at least, of filtered or direct sunshine. Next, in terms of the soil or the growing media itself, it, they like well-drained, moisture-retentive type of growing media. What do I mean by that? Basically, when you water 
the plant, the water drains out quickly. Okay? It does not you know, stay in the soil and wet, keep the plant under wet feed conditions okay? because you'll suffocate the roots and the plants will die. Okay? And this is something that you need to take note of if you grow them outdoors where you know, it rains, whenever it rains or when it's during the rainy season. You have to be a little bit on the careful side. And they need to be moisture retentive. Because when plants grow big, like our, our friend here, okay, this Brazilian starfish, I have to water it at least twice a day because she's a very, very dr big drinker. All right? They will wilt if you don't water them. And if you live in a high rise where it is very windy, and if your pot is small, then they will drink up doubly fast. So keep up with the water needs of your plant. All right? Next, in terms of fertilizer, it is important for you to boost the growth of your plants. When they are young, you can use a balanced fertilizer, which has NPK ratio that is um, you know, the same, 5, 5, 5, and so on, so that you can boost the growth of the plant, so that it bulks up very quickly, right? so that it will be strong. However, do not overdose. You manage that because if too much soft growth on your plant can lead to issues. Because a lot of soft growth will invite sucking pests such as aphids and white flies to your plants. So manage the plant nutrition a little bit. And when the plant is starting to flower, you can switch over to something that has higher phosphorus or potassium okay, ratio content that is. So when you buy a fertilizer, you see the last two numbers are higher. They, that fertilizer will be suitable for you to grow uh, plants that are flowering and fruiting so as to boost fruit production and flower production, okay? So I hope, you know, these very basic tips will actually, um, you know, be clear so that all of you can get going. So before I, um, you know, go on to even more complicated stuff here, let me show you a picture. The shelter that I use to grow plants in Jurong Lake Gardens. The first picture, please. Yes. So this is a very simple shelter that I did up in Jurong Lake Gardens where I work now. And you can see some of the chilies that I showcased here in that shelter using PVC pipes and a very clear, plus, uh, and a clear plastic sheet on top. So why is this done that way? First, we did share, I did share with you that all your plants here need good sunlight. So a clear sheet of plastic is needed so that you let as much light as you can through it but what does that plastic sheet do? It actually blocks out the rain. Because now we are re re reaching the end of the year, we are expecting high rainfall. And I did share with you earlier that water, the plants love water, they need to drink. But they hate when it, their feet is constantly wet. For those of you who have actually grown some of this, or this, I would say, some of the more sensitive cultivars, you will actually notice that under heavy rain, right? If you don't put that clear shelter on top, you know, your leaves will be hit by the rain. They'll get fungal spots. Next week, I think I see the other, I have a picture. Let's take a look at the picture with a fungal spots so that, yes, this one, right? You can see that some of you would have encountered this and it spreads, all right? And the leaves will drop. And why, do, why, why does this happen, actually? When heavy rainfall occurs, the rain will hit the leaf tissues and kind of injured them. So you have an open wound. And with rain, it passes through the air, there are spores and so on, and soil splashes bring up microorganisms, which will then infect the plant, and you get fungal spots like that. So instead of relying on fungicides, a lot of us who grow edibles don't like fungicides, isn't it, right? Chemicals, right? That's the reason why a lot of us want to grow safer food for ourselves, isn't it? So the best way is to prevent it from happening. So you shelter your plants, that would actually help you to reduce the incidence of fungal diseases. And of course, it prevents wet feet from occurring so that your plants don't die with when their roots actually dry. You know, if it's too wet, the roots will drown and they will actually die. Okay? So that is the first tip of, you know, first secret tip I have for you. Grow them under shelter. Of course, there are cultivars that you can grow that will be able to take the rain. I'm sure some of you, I've gone to the allotment gardens, you guys are actually growing pretty interesting things there. There are a, a couple of chilies that I saw that can take the, the, the rain. And actually, to be frank, for those of you, if you are good at grafting plants, 
you might want to try grafting some of the sensitive cultivars that I have here onto the one that can take our tropical conditions. That will help you a lot to combat the issues of wet feet during the rainy season. Okay, so let us move on to the next set of slides to show you some pictures. So let's take a look at what I have prepared for you. Okay, this is, these are my lemon drop chilies. Okay, you can see there are black color spots there. Um, not pimples, eh? but they are actually the mark which are made by fruit flies when they try to lay their eggs. Okay, so um, those of you who grow fruit trees, you'll be familiar with this. When you cut open your mangoes, you've got maggots inside. So chilies are also affected by fruit flies. Okay, whenever a fruit fly tries to lay an egg on the fruit itself, the chili plant knows my fruit is going to be gone, going to be destroyed, I will abort it. So what will happen to it is that the fruits will drop. And if you have a very bad fruit fly infestation in your garden, potentially you might have a case whereby your plants will abort all its fruits and you have no chilies to harvest. And fruit flies are difficult to control using regular pesticides because they just come and go. And again, we don't want to use pesticides, isn't it? So there's a way that I can share with you how you can make you know, your own fruit fly trap to control or manage this issue. So I have something prepared here. So this is a plastic bottle. Okay, everybody can buy, uh, you know, get it. So you need to burn holes on the side, somewhere in the middle. All right? I, would, I actually used a soldering iron. Of course, you can use a drill or something like that. But make it small, not too big, because you want the fly to go in, but not able to come out easily. But put it on the, on the middle part of it. The bottom part is where you fill it up with water. You can put in a little bit of soap, you can put in neem, or, uh, in, uh, neem oil, the insecticide that you, we always use all the time, put it in there. Because when the fruit fly gets attracted inside, it tries to, it tries to struggle, right, isn't it? Then some of them will fall into the water and they'll drown. And the, and the um, neem oil will help with the process. Sounds cruel, but sometimes we have no choice to do it. And of course, the thing that makes this fruit, tra fruit fly trap work is this. You need to take a look. I'm going to unscrew the bottle. So I have a bit of tissue. You can use cotton, cloth, anything, all right, that soaks up something. So you need to go to the nursery and buy fruit fly attractant, all right? You soak this with the fruit fly attractant, and then you fill it up with water, all right? And you just replace the cap and hang it in your growing area where your chilies are. And in the morning, you'll see fruit flies going in, you know, and after that, they will get trapped. So that will help you to reduce fruit fly infestation. Of course, if you find if you're not the DIY sort of person, nowadays online shopping platforms have lots of things that you can buy, and you can actually key in fruit fly trap, and you can find one that you can buy. All right, the pheromone you probably need to replace from time to time. Okay, so what is the next issue that chili growers and capsicum growers will face? Let's take a look. Ah, how many of you have seen this? You know, the underside of the leaf got this white thing that's there. Okay, there's a white, um, you know, bits and dust like that. So, that is actually an indication to tell you your, fruit, uh, your chilies are infested with white flies. Okay, this is the, the, one of the life cycle stages of white flies. And you need to control this. Because when this happens, because you see the thing about this it is that on the underside of the leaf, if you don't check your leaves, all right, what will happen is that the infestation goes unnoticed, all right? And the, plant, and the pest will actually have a very good time, you know, sucking the life out of your plant. So white flies, you have to be careful. It's a sucking pest. It will actually spread viral diseases, okay? Some of you will realize that the leaves will become crinkled, have um, mottling yellow patches on the leaves, and the plant, will be, plant growth will be affected. And mind you, viral diseases in plants are not curable, okay? And white flies actually bring with them another pest, which is broad, which are broad, what we call broad mites. They are microscopic, they'll take a rye on, your white fly, uh, on the white fly and infest your plants. Okay, let's take a look at the next picture. Ah, how many of you actually see this on your chili plants? Okay, the, leaves the new leaves become crumpled, they become brittle, the growing tip dies, and the plant eventually will just drop all its leaves, and that's it, your plant just goes bye-bye, you know, to you. So that symptom or the, that sign actually is what we call broad mice, 
Okay, it's a it, it's a reaction of the plant to broad mite infestation. Okay, you can just key in to the internet B R O A D. Okay, broad mite. Uh, it's very interesting. Why is it called broad mite? But it's very very small, right? So you can't see it with your eyes. And they will. And when you see their presence, often is when the plant actually has that crumpled leaves that you see. Okay, and it's actually quite um, you know serious, and your plants can actually die. So when you have broad mites and you have white flies, okay, these are things. These are two pests that you probably need to catch it when it's very early. It's not when it is very serious. Then when you try to do anything about it, it can be very very difficult to manage, especially if you're using organic means. All right. So you need to check your plants, take appropriate action. You can use neem oil, okay, or if you can get your hands on a new botanical pesticide, which is called matrin, M-A-T-R-I-N-E. Okay, it's, thicker, it's extracted from a Chinese medicinal herb, okay, called Sophora flavicens, Kushen. That pesticide is botanical, environmentally friendly, uh, it's low toxicity, but it's very effective against uh, white flies and broad mice. Okay, so that is something that what you might want to look out for. Not easy to find. All right, so these are some very common problems. Okay, you have fruit flies, all right, and you have, you know, uh, your broad mice, and then you have your fruit flies, okay? And of course, you have, you need to shelter your plants. So, I would say in Singapore, these are some of the very common problems that you will encounter when you grow your chilies and capsicums. And by, you know, taking note, watching your plants every day, some of you like to talk to your plants, right? <laughs> Correct? So, Go and look at your plant, you know, flip the leaves every day, go and see whether if there are any white flies and all that. That will help a lot. Okay? Because we want to do something that is environmentally friendly. Yeah? We are going to eat it. You don't want to have chemical pesticides, correct? Right? So you would want to use the least toxic means, so you need to take action early. But one of the things that I must emphasize here, because you're growing edible plants, whatever that you use, especially organic pesticides, homemade remedies and whatnot. There is something that I need to warn all of you, which is what we call food safety. All right? M make sure you soak and you wash your produce you know, thoroughly before cooking. And especially for some of you, if you like to eat things raw, you know, uh, for salads and all that, the washing part is especially important. I'm, I'm trained in food science, so this is something that is very close to heart. And I happen to become a horticulturist, a gardener, and you know, I combine the two things together, I'm sharing it with you. How relevant is it, right? Okay, so I would say that I, my sharing is more or less done. I want to keep it short and sweet, you know, tell you straight to the point what are the things that I want all of you to know, okay? And now I want to take some questions, okay? Because um, I have about, say, 20 plus minutes, so I can answer a lot of questions, right? So I hope I'll be able to answer your questions. And so let me just... Pull out the laptop, I'll say, an iPad here, huh? to take a look at some questions. Okay, so I have Teresa Cole. She asks, what do you mean by soft growth? Does it appear? Let me see. Give me a minute. Huh? All right. So Teresa asks, what do you mean by soft growth? Okay, soft growth means this. Some of you, have you noticed that when you try growing your plants, they grow very, very rapidly. You know, the new leaves, you know, they are very, very soft. They are not as uh, tough or hard 